mystic is that you feel something that you don't feel anywhere else. And that is a city that you've never visited before as if it's your home. Isn't that right? For those of you who've been to Medina, isn't this what you feel? When you go to Medina, it's as if this is your home, as if you've somehow visited this place before, a peace that you feel, a tranquility that you feel. That emotion can only be found in that city. Really. And that's actually mentioned in the Quran. One of the special characteristics of the city of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Because of the blessed existence of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that city and also how Allah blessed that city. That gives you a sense of a real spiritual antidote which helps you overcome that detachment that you felt in this life. And especially when your entire life goes from you know, the busy streets of London to now every aspect of your life slowed down and now surrounded and scheduled around the salawat, the adhan. In fact, one of my, uh, one of my extended family members, he came, he's a businessman. He says, well, what kind of life is this? Every, every time you look around, there's another adhan you hear. He's not used to living in a society where adhan is going off. So he was kind of joking. SubhanAllah, every time you hear, adhan is going off and you have to go to prayer. Whether you like it or not, shops close there. You have to go pray. You have to go pray. We're here, SubhanAllah, how much you have to go out everywhere. I was just thinking about this. When we were walking past East London Masjid, and it was uh, you know, during, uh, almost Maghrib time, and it started to rain. SubhanAllah, you have to find a place to pray in London. And that sometimes is difficult. So it takes a lot of taqwa for you to go find a place where can I pray? Maybe you're not near a masjid. Maybe you have to walk a, a, a distance. This requires a lot of effort. Whereas if you live in a Muslim country, just you know, subhanAllah, so park the car, find some place. Every gas station, every place has a salawat area, even in front of shops. So subhanAllah is the element of ease. And in the course of my study of Islam, there's an also a, ta a reconnection that took place from this detachment. And that is knowing, subhanAllah, the more I studied the life of Rasulullah the more practical Islam became. When you study the life of this person and the struggles that he went through, والسلام, we learn that his life is the application of revelation. And more so than that, something very specific about the life of Rasulullah A question to you all. Was the Quran given to Rasulullah like we have it today in the book form? Al-Fatiha to an 114 surahs, given to Rasulullah as I like, hear, give this to the humanity. Was it given that way? No, how was it given? My man, he wants to talk. This one, I'll go ahead. Via speech, yeah, of course, it's, it's spoken, but how was it revealed? Over time, exactly. The Prophet ﷺ, certain life events would take place, certain situations would occur, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran as a guide for those specific scenarios. For you all know, for example, who studied Sirah, in the sixth year the Prophet ﷺ went to do Umrah. He was blocked from that. There was a treaty of Hudaybiyah saying, you're not allowed to do Umrah this year, come next year. We're going to block you from that. The Muslims were, felt like this was a one-sided pact. There would be a 10-year truce with the Quraysh, but they were not allowed to do Umrah that year. Their hearts were heavy. Allah subhanahu revealed what? Which surah? Right after that event. Surah Al-Fatih. The conquest. SubhanAllah, how is this conquest? Because Islam was allowed to spread peacefully. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that's conquest. Now you will see Islam spreading. When there's peace, Islam spreads. So that was now in your mind, SubhanAllah, you know the context of Surah Al-Fatih. Every time you read Surah Al-Fatih, Ibn Mas'ud said, people think that the conquest is what? What's, when you hear the word conquest, which event do you associate in the life of Rasulullah Which event? Fath Mecca, right? The conquest of Mecca. Ibn Mas'ud says, when we say Fath, people think it's Fath Mecca. But no Allah, Fath, according to the Sahaba, was the pact of Hudaybiyah. SubhanAllah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised them victory once Islam spread. My point being is, the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is almost plotted through the entire Quran. So when you journey through the Quran, imagine there were specific events that happened for every single uh, bunch of ayat or entire surahs throughout the life of Rasulullah What would happen? What kind, of, what kind of relationship with the Quran would we have if we just knew those contexts? That journey through the Quran, through the life of Rasulullah is what I spent the past 10 years of my life and inshallah more to learn. 
the chronological revelation of the Quran according to the life of Rasulullah and in the last remaining time that I have with you all I want to just give you a taste of that as we all know the first five ayat of the Quran that were revealed were from Surah Iqra right Surah Al-Alaq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says read and recite in the name of your, your Lord that created giving the purpose of humanity attaching them to the Lord Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and then thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them through this journey to build in them foundations of faith that made that community the best community in the history of humanity. What was it that was taught in the early, early beginning of Islam? How did they became, become who they are? I will touch upon this shortly right now, inshallah. The very co first complete surah to be revealed after surah alaq, the first five ayat is Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha is the first complete surah to be revealed. Hence why it's at the beginning of the Quran. It's the introduction to the Quran. There are seven themes that are repeated in the entire Quran that are in there. Seven objectives of the Quran are there in Surah Al-Fatiha. And then the second complete surah to be revealed thereafter was a chapter that many of us have probably memorized when we were young. And that is Surah Al-Duha. Surah Al-Duha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in this chapter, chapter 93, after saying, I'll do Bilaam Surah Jim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Wadduha wallayni da sajama waddaaka rabbuka wa ma qala. Wala al akhiratu khayrun laka min al ula. Wala sawfa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda. Alam yajidika yatima fa'awa. Wa wajadaka dolla fahada. ووجدك عائنا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah I want you to understand something this was the earliest Quran to be revealed meaning every single Muslim that became Muslim memorized this surah after Fatiha and then Ayat of Surah Al-Alaq, this Surah. So I want you to imagine the powerful message of this Surah that was ingrained in the hearts of the believers in the earliest part of Islam. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, by the early morning illumination and by the night that grows still, then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gives four promises to the believer. Four promises to the new Muslim. Four promises to the community of Islam. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala first says, your Lord has never forsaken you nor will leave you. Number one, Allah will never leave you. Allah will never forsake you. The second promise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hate you or despise you. Meaning, Allah will not allow a mistake, a sin that you commit to define you, subhanAllah. The mistakes and the sins that we commit, Allah will not allow that to define us and hate us for it and despise us. Number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, your future will always be better than your present. Whatever you're going through, the future will be better. Don't worry. And number four, Allah will keep giving you and giving you and giving you until you are pleased. I want you to just imagine, if these were the four lessons and promises that we were taught, Allah tells the believers when they have just accepted Islam, what kind of faith would we have had when we were learning the Quran? What kind of faith would new Muslims have when they come to the masjid and this is what they're taught. Allah promises you these four things. Whereas, I want you to just reflect over a question. When you think about how many Muslims, they actually don't read the Quran, they don't have any attachment to the Quran until when? Ramadan. Then you take the Quran from the top shelf, you open the 50 cases that we put over it, dust it off, and then inshallah maybe we read it, maybe once, in the month of Ramadan. Imagine if some people have that kind of connection to the Quran. Why don't so many Muslims read the Quran? Because of one thing. They may have associated pain to this beautiful thing. Why? Because remember, if you can think about when you were a child and you were learning to read the Quran with your Qari Saab or your, your teacher or your family member and whoever, if you made a mistake, what did you get on the back of your head? One of these, right? You got a little smack on the back of your head. Somebody maybe yelled at you. Somebody maybe thought, oh, you're doing this wrong. So they've associated pain subliminally to such a beautiful thing. And this is called cognitive dissonance. When you attach a feeling to an action, which is negative. 
So imagine, instead of that, if our community taught what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided the believers in the early part of Islam, these four promises, what kind of life you, would you and I have? If we go through the darknesses of our struggles and hardships, and we know Allah does not ever leave you. What kind of life would we have if we're going through such pain that maybe even some Muslims contemplate suicide? But you remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not define you by your weakest moments. And Allah is always with you. In Leicester, I said this to one of the, to, to the gathering. A brother came up, came to me after the program. And he said, I'm a doctor. And he started crying. He said, I was just released from the hospital for having suicidal thoughts. And I promise you the only thing that I recited the entire time that helped save my life is Surah Al-Duha. Allah will never leave me. This is a real scenario that happened just a couple days ago. Imagine, subhanAllah, and he was, he was very touched because he was not reflecting that this was the first thing that Allah taught the Muslims at that time. I want you all to just think about what are some of the lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the Muslim community and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built their hearts in the following ayat which are all Mecki. All of them were the earliest revelation, meaning the earliest lessons that Allah taught the believers and ingrained into their hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zukhruf, وَلَئِنْ سَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ خَلَقَهُنَّ الْعَزِيزُ الْعَلِيمُ If you were to ask them, O Prophet, who created the heavens and the earth, they will certainly say, meaning their faith was built with certainty of the Almighty who could never be empowered, overpowered, and the all-knowing is the one who created them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built their faith, number one, with absolute certainty. And I want you to focus on this. There's no clinical psychology program, there's no counselor, there's no anything that can guarantee you certainty. In anything. We only have certainty in one thing in life. What is that? Death. There's no certainty. A doctor in Birmingham came up to me. And he said to me, after this session that we had, he said, Shaykh, I want to tell you an interesting story about certainty. I said, what? He said, I had a patient just the other day. She could not sleep the entire night and would not take her medication because she's afraid of the surgery next day that I was going to perform on her. She was so anxious. So the nurses, when I came to my shift, they said, you know, this lady you know, might cause herself harm out of anxiety. Please speak to her. So she said, he said, I went to speak to her. And I looked at her chart. The surgery she was going to go through is not extremely dangerous but she had such anxiety I said why do you have such anxiety she said I'm afraid I'm going to die I want you doctor to promise me that I'm not going to die tomorrow so the doctor looked at her and she said I spoke to her a little bit but her anxiety wasn't going away so just to make her anxiety go away he said I promise you're not going to die tomorrow because like 99% chance there's no way like Allah Alam, in his experience and she said you could see her face change. She just relaxed. She said, thank you, doctor. I really, thank you. I really appreciate it. And he said, no problem. He spoke to her some more. And as he was walking out the, do out the door, he turned around and he said, you know what? I just want to let you know something. I don't know if I'm going to live when I put my foot outside the door. How can I tell you that you're going to live tomorrow? He said, no one can guarantee this for you. But know that you're going to be okay in good hands, inshallah. And she, she was fine after that. I mean, the idea of certainty is built and ingrained in our faith. That we have certainty in not only death, we have certainty in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His promises. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that that certainty is then built with something else. There's a very specific characteristic of the believer that, ha that has built that certainty. And that characteristic that Allah ingrains in them is tawakkul, absolute reliance on Allah. There's no one you trust on this planet more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ingrains in their hearts in Surah Al An'am? Why should you trust absolutely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else beyond Him? Because with Him are the keys of the unseen. No one has access to them except Him. And He knows what is in the land and the sea. Not even a leaf falls without His knowledge nor a grain in the darkness of the earth or anything, green or dry, except that is written in a perfect record, which Allah has proportioned to 
your future, your risk, your sustenance is in his hand. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that has access to that, the only access that you have to that is through dua, through asking him. Allah ingrains that in the hearts of the believers, certainty and then absolute reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah then speaks to the nearness of this Lord that he has built in the hearts of the believers that Allah is the, Azza wa Jal is the most nearest to them and hence why they should call to him. In Surah Qaf, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Indeed, it is we who created all of humanity and we fully know what even their souls and their thoughts whisper to themselves. Yet we are closer to them even than their jugular vein. So you should have more trust in Allah Azza wa Jal because of your nearness to Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then builds into the believers the example of this life. What is the example of this life in the believer's mind? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the believers in Surah Yunus, إِنَّمَا مَثَلُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا إِنْ أَنزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَاخْتَرَطَ بِهِ نَبَاتُ الْأَرْضِ مِمَّا يَأْكُلُ النَّاسِ وَالْأَنْعَامِ حَتَّى إِذَا أَخَذَتِ الْأَرْضُ زُخْرُفَهَا وَزَيَّنَتْ وَظَنَّ أَهْلُهَا أَنَّهُمْ قَادِرُونَ عَلَيْهَا أَتَاهَا أَمْرُنَا لَيْلًا أَوْ نَهَارًا فَجَعَلْنَاهَا حَصِيدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the example of the life of this world is just like the rain we sent down from the sky. Do you have access of when to make it rain? No, I mean, alhamdulillah, you're in London, it always rains anyway. But the point being is, if you had access, can you make it rain on demand? No, you can't. That's the one thing that's in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, when we sent down rain from the sky, and it brings harvest to the land, when the, when the harvest bears fruit, the farmer or the person who's in charge of the land, he thinks that it was because of him. I was the one who planted the seeds. I was the one who irrigated the farm. I was the one who has a PhD. I was the one who owns the business. I was the one who has the crypto portfolio and made money on Bitcoin. I was the one who has a Instagram following. I was the one who has a TikTok views. I'm the one who has this and that. It's me, it's me, it's me until what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we take it away in one moment, all of it. And then they really realize it was all in the hands of Allah. When I was in Malaysia, I was teaching there. A young woman who was on a crutch comes walking up to me. And she says, can I please speak to you? I said, Tawla, go ahead. She starts crying. I said to her, what's wrong? It's okay, inshallah, we'll, we'll work out whatever the problem is. She says, no, I want to tell you what happened to me. I am the most followed Instagram, among the most followed Instagram in Malaysia. I don't know you know who she was, right? But she, she was like an Instagram model and she had so many followers. She said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested me in, in ways that really made me question everything I was doing. I said, what? She said, subhanAllah, she had multiple miscarriages. Multiple miscarriages. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that she go through an accident that made her fully paralyzed. She lost, and she said in that moment when you realize you've lost everything, because why? As you know, Instagram is based on posting more. Now what are you gonna post? So she lost everything. And she said, in that moment when I questioned my life and I questioned everything that I was doing, I became the most closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I prayed. And I found nearness to Allah. And I found happiness there. Allah answered a number of my du'as. And when the doctor said, you will never be able to walk again, Allah gave me the will to walk. And he said, you, you see me now in front of you. And now I have the ability now to go back to my account, but now I'm in a better state of faith. I'm just afraid of one thing. I said, What's, what are you afraid of? She said that when I was paralyzed, I was actually more happier than I was walking on with my Instagram account. And she said, I, I, I was like, I don't really understand that. She said, I know most people can't, but I want you to understand that I felt happy. I'm afraid that I go back and I lose this happiness. That's what she was afraid of. SubhanAllah. How Allah gives that sweetness of faith in people's hearts. So she, she was looking for comfort and I said, listen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you this opportunity to give da'wah to all of these people that are following, millions of people, right? So use this for good. And she became happy with that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, gave us the example that if you use the tools that you have for good and with a sincere intention, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you realize that the true worth of this life is if you associate blessings to Allah 
then you understand the true worth of this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then told them and taught them who the best of them are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ O oh humanity, we have created you from a male and female and made you into people and tribes so that you may get to know one another, not fight one another. You're from Silat, I'm from Dhaka, right? You're Pashtun, I'm Farsi. You're from Halab, I'm from Damashq, Maidan. Right? You're from Jazair, my couscous is better than you from Maghrib. And then Somalia, mashallah, have their tribes. And Nigeria have their different provinces, Uruba and Hausa. And so on and so forth. All of these, you're from Punjab, I'm from Islamabad or whatever. Right? You guys know these differences. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our differences to celebrate them. To find honor in our differences and our diversities. Not to find differences in them. And to create divisiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surely the most noble of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those with blonde hairs and blue eyes, right? Because that's what's being told on the, on the news today, isn't it? Those people who are refugees, we accept them because they have blonde hair and blue eyes like us. Don't you hear this on the news? Not those refugees from the third world countries because they're uncivilized and we're civilized. A'udhu billahi minash rajeem. Alhamdulillah for having a faith that taught us by obligation to take care of people, not conditionally because of the color of their hair or the color of their eyes, but because they are genuine souls in need. Say Alhamdulillah. And that's why one of the most beautiful things I saw this past week after seeing the ridiculous things that was being said by leaders in this, in this continent. People who are supposedly have to have some humanity in some sense. Islamic Relief announced this week that they announced the Ukrainian Emergency Relief Fund. I was so proud, Alhamdulillah. Because that's what our faith teaches us. But what does your faith teach you? To take black people off the train who are trying to seek safety from war zone. And you've seen the videos. Literally, because of the skin color, they were taken off the train and they were citizens of the country. And that's why you see the true value of a society in times of hardship. Alhamdulillah for the deen of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The most noble in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who are most conscious of Allah azza wa jalla. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter, after ingraining four promises, certainty is the root of faith. And it is based on reliance in Allah and nearness to Him that makes you call to Him in every one of your difficulties. And understanding your station with Allah and Allah's station with you and understanding the best of you are those who are most conscious of Him. After that, 115, over 115 descriptions of the believer was mentioned in the Quran for us to aspire to become better. Personal development, over 115 descriptions in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says among them, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, successful are the believers, not the ones who are the Fortune 500 CEOs, not the ones who have the most following, but those who are, have all of that and they are believers as well. Those who are humble in their prayers, those who are, those who avoid idle talk and those who give from their wealth in order to purify their souls. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ingrained into the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I end with this inshallah ta'ala, a characteristic. We are not a monastic faith, meaning, if you were to come spend your entire day in this masjid, you're actually going against the obligation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not a faith that if you come only to the masjid, you're a good person. No, you're a good Muslim if you are a benefit to others in society. And you follow and come to the masjid. Those two come together. Servitude to Allah, service to humanity. They go together. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this powerful uh, objective that they are successors on the land. They are those who have accountability and responsibility over humanity. They are the ones that take care of miskinam wa yatima wa asira. Meaning the most downtrodden and the lowest of society who people ignore. And the po po people of poverty, and those who are orphans and those who are even Ignored by even the mass society, those who are incarcerated. Those who are incarcerated, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of them.
take care of their families. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ taught this in one amazing characteristic. And that is called genuine care. Genuine care. How a poet wrote about this, about the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in a story. This story is not real. But parts of it is real. He just gathered a number of things and spoke about the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day was walking in Medina. And he sees a young man on the side of the road, very sad and crying. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stops and he asks him, why are you sad and why are you crying? This is true. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did this. Meaning, and the poet said, look what great man we had as an example who was the leader of the empire, who was the busiest person that you could ever imagine, yet he had the genuine care to see sadness in the face of a young man on the street, and he stops to ask him, why are you sad? So the young man says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm sad because I miss my father. My father has passed away. He said, what, what happened to him? He said, he passed away as a shaheed, a martyr, defending Islam, standing alongside you in a battle a long time ago. But I miss him. And this subhanAllah teaches us something. That even if people die as shuhada, there's still the pain of acknowledging that there's a, there's a hole missing, there's something missing in your life. Even if they were the best of people. So what happens is, the Prophet ﷺ says, do you miss him? He says, yes. He says, what if I were to console you with the following? What if I were to tell you that in Aisha radiallahu anha, you have a mother. And in Fatima radiallahu anha, you have a sister. And in Ali radiallahu anhu, you have an uncle. And in Hassan and Hussein, you have brothers. And I hope that in me, you can be consoled that I could be a father. And the young man, out of happiness, he goes and hugs the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. out of how much care he showed to this young man to console his heart. This characteristic is called genuine care that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam instilled in his community. And he said to us to impart this with a touch of empathy. A touch of empathy. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ has said that the greatest reward in the action with the greatest reward is to put happiness into the heart of a believer. He didn't say jihad fi sabirillah. He didn't say going to Hajj 30 million times. He said putting happiness into the heart of a believer and a human is the most rewarded action in Islam. Is that quantifiable, that tangible? Today we have an Islamic Relief fundraiser for happiness in people's hearts. It's not quantifiable, it's not tangible. But the Prophet ﷺ had taught that with what's called a touch of empathy, and I end with this. And that is, the Prophet ﷺ says, if you want to soften your heart, then do this action. What is this action? I'm asking you all. Don't look at him, look at me. If you want to soften your heart, do this action. What is the action the Prophet doesn't mention? Huh? Dhikr. Amazing. No, that's not the answer. Yes, salam. You said what? Charity. Okay. The brother is right, mashallah. The Prophet said in Hadith al Allah Ta'ala anhu Muslim Muhammad, said that if you want to soften your heart, go to the orphan and pat the orphan on the head. Wipe your hand over the head of the orphan. Allah will take care of your needs. Allahu Akbar. And soften your heart. Why? Imagine, look at your day-to-day -day busy lives. How busy you are. May Allah bless you for even staying today, tomorrow you work. I know. Like Shaykh is talking a lot. I know, trust me. I'm almost done. But imagine your busy lives. And you go out of your way to visit an orphan or to take care of an orphan. And you show presence to that young man or woman or that individual. You look into the eyes of a person who's lost their mother or father or both. And you find presents like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave them presents. And give them such comfort as if you're saying, I'm your family. To the extent that it feels so close to you that they allow you to put your hand on their head and to give them comfort. That touch of empathy is what made that nation great. And remember the ayat that we started in Surah Al-Duha. It's not over. It's all because if you think about all of the mothers and fathers who have lost children, whether in Somalia, whether in Pakistan and Kashmir or Afghanistan or Syria or Palestine or Burma, wherever our mothers 
who have lost their children, our fathers have lost their children, people have lost their parents, been displaced from their homes. You ever wonder what makes them have the ability to overcome this pain, this difficulty, that can be unimaginable except for the one who has faced it? Those four promises. Those four promises. Allah will never forsake you. Allah will never hate and despise you. Allah will say that your future is better than your present. And we will keep giving you until you are pleased. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Did He not find you an orphan? And He took care of you. Did He not find you lost? And He guided you. Did He not find you in need? And made you self-sufficient. So then do not be harsh with the orphans, those who need you. Those who need you the most, don't be harsh with them. And do not turn away the one that asks for help and speak about the blessings of your Lord, the greatest of which is Islam. This is the journey of the Quran, my brothers. This is what our faith taught us and how that was built in the lives of those people. So I give you all the homework, which is, inshallah, in the month of Ramadan, I want you all to pick a surah of the Quran, like Surah Yusuf, Surah Taha, Surah Al-Hadid, which was recited today. Beautifully, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the Qari'ah. And in the second rakah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, beautifully, all of this so that you do not feel any remorse over what has passed you, or that you don't become overtly happy over what He has given you. Allah knows best what's for you, you don't. Allah Akbar. Imagine you actively think about what's being recited. Take Surah Al Hadid this month of Ramadan that was recited today and reflect on it deeply, ayah by ayah about what was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ingraining in the hearts of those people to strengthen them. Just one surah, Maryam, Yusuf, these are all the earliest revelations, Surah Al-An'am. And inshallah you will find that your view of the Qur'an and how it's so applicable in our lives will change. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to reach Ramadan, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah azza wa jalla allow us to fast and alhamdulillah come back to the masajid, to pray taraweeh, to hear the Qur'an. May Allah Azzawajal allow us to stand in Ramadan with our faith and Iman and Ihtisab and to fast Ramadan with Iman and Ihtisab to allow us to reach Laylatul Qadr and to allow us to be gathered with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the highest levels of Jannah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa baraka ala habibina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jma'in wa jazakum wa khirjza. Jazakallah khair to Ustad Hasib who's been traveling with us and I promise you I know how tired he is as well as since this morning, in fact last night he was traveling with us and event after event. This is the, the last and final one inshallah where all the barakah is going to um, uh, come to an end inshallah with Sheikh. Uh, we've been traveling for a long time but there's a purpose behind this brothers and sisters and we mentioned that there are so many calamities that befall human on this earth, Muslim, non-Muslims alike. And our level of humanity as Muslim is the most premium. We don't discriminate against color, race, status. Why? Because we know our Allah judges us. We don't do things for the media we don't do things for show we do it because we want to please the almighty allah so yes islamic relief are happy to release a campaign for ukraine however we're also not foolish we're very aware of some of the double standards that exist in our society afghanistan when the americans left was all over the news but it's all disappeared what is the situation in Afghanistan now is the real question, brothers and sisters. This is a man-made problem. Starvation in Afghanistan at this moment of time means that one million children within this year, one million children within this year will possibly lose their life to hunger. Now one million is a number and it's very easy to start talking about facts and figures.
But if you bring it close to home, one child, my child, your child, your daughter, my, my daughter, your son, my son, if that one life was part of that one million figure, our hearts would start to tremble. If I was to ask or say to anybody here that there's a chance that tomorrow your son or daughter won't be with you, our hearts start trembling. But it's easy for us to say one million children in Afghanistan may die this year purely due to hunger. And it's not reported. Why is it a man-made problem? Because of the sanctions that's been put onto them, because of the funding cuts, because of Afghanistan. In fact, 70% of the population of Afghanistan before the Americans left depended on international aid for the day-to-day -day meal. 70%, there's 40 million people living there. 70% of them only ate because of international aid. All of this is drying up. And that's when Islamic Relief said no. In fact, we will put more effort than rather just sending out email shots and text shots. In fact, we will do an entire tour across the country with people like Sheikh Hasib to raise funds for this project. Now, tonight I, we're gonna do something together, inshallah, with everyone's support. You will see it's the little support that everyone puts in together where we can make wonders happen. We want to support, first of all, families with building homes, in, uh, or bu building temporary shelter homes for Afghan, Afghan families. Currently the situation, our chairman, our director, in fact, end of last year went out to Afghanistan. And some of the stories that he heard, and some of the eyewitness stories that he, the families that he's met, are harrowing. Women who came to our doors crying in the middle of the night, knocking on one of our staff members' door. He's from Afghanistan, he lives there, he works for Stand Relief. Knocking on his door, the woman's crying in tears. She has three children with him, saying, take my children. Take my children, do whatever you like, but I can't bear to see my children hungry anymore. Three days they haven't eaten anything. We're looking for scraps of food. People of our neighbors used to give us their leftovers. Three days they haven't eaten anything. Take my children, I can't bear to see them like this anymore. No mother. In fact, what would it take for any of us to give up our child? What would it take? Even if someone offered you a million pounds, not a single soul here will say, take my child. So imagine the pressure that's going into the minds of these sisters. So to build a home or to build a temporary shelter, why? Because there's some pictures on the wall, in, 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 the, in the frame you'll see, there's some pictures of houses, of a video, inshallah, I'll introduce you to the video in a second. There's pictures of houses that you will see, of, they're just literally a stick with some material. This is what people call a house. It's not a real house, it's just literally a couple of sticks. When it rains, when it snows, it's minus degrees in certain parts of Afghanistan. And people are living there with two children and three children. There's a video that I want to quickly play for you, inshallah. So that gives you a bit more of a background of the situation there. Um, if I can have the video played, Hamza. And then I'll come back to you, inshallah. Whilst Afghanistan I'm video is facing one of the worst humanitarian crises on earth. Years of political turmoil, a collapsing economy, the impact of COVID-19 and one of the worst droughts the country has experienced in 27 years are the makings of a catastrophic famine facing the Afghan people. Terrifyingly, tens of thousands of displaced Afghans have been made homeless as they travel cross-country in search of food. Now, without adequate shelter to protect themselves from the elements, many are extremely vulnerable. Children, the elderly, Women and men are fighting for survival. Currently, a staggering 22 million people, more than half of the population of Afghanistan, don't know where the next meal is coming from. Without your help, millions of Afghans will be just one step away from an extreme scarcity of food. Daily life for Afghans facing homelessness and food scarcity is becoming intolerable. In an effort to access basic human rights, like food and shelter, some have had to resort to giving away their children to others who can provide the means for their survival. People like Bibi Naz.
دوه نور لورګانې مې تللې دي مور سره شمالي ته او پیندې د خره زما دا امید ده چې زه غواړم ما سره داسې کومک وشي هېڅ په ما خو وایي هسې نیم دا دنیا تېره شوله زه غواړم چې زما د بچیانو هم دا زما غوندې نه شي باید ښه شي باید دی درس وایي دی تعلیم وکړي دی ښه واغوندې دی ښه و ښه بوټونه پښو کې ښه درس کولو نه ولري دی لاش مخته Out in the cold, without adequate shelter, millions of lives are at stake right now. Freezing temperatures are a terrifying prospect for the one million children who are already at risk of dying, and the three million facing malnourishment due to starvation. We cannot afford to turn our backs on the Afghan people. Islamic Relief is working on the ground right now to provide essential food, shelter, and winter items to Afghans like Bibi. who without your help face starvation and fatally cold temperatures. We have been in Afghanistan for 20 years, working to provide more than just emergency relief for Afghan communities. But with limited access to the resources they need to survive, we need to get them the immediate relief they need, now. 23 million people in Afghanistan are facing acute hunger. The country is on the verge of famine. Food trucks like these that Islamic Relief are distributing on the ground in Afghanistan are lifesavers. In a few weeks' time, Afghanistan will be covered in snow. Hundreds of thousands are expected to die. Time is of the essence. We need to reach as many people as possible. Please, donate now. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. Uh, inshallah, the sister should be able to hear and see the same footage, inshallah. If it's not working, we'll double check, inshallah, from uh, the technician side. But just, you've seen the video and you've seen the homes. You've seen the structure of these homes. They're not homes. They're shelter. They're not even, they're not even tents. These are the stuff that you would buy for 50 pounds from August to put in your back garden and you, so the kids can play in the summer. But that's what people call home in Afghanistan at this moment in time. We want to build shelters, temporary shelters for them so that at least... In the middle of the night, the tent's not blown away. Or at least in the middle of the night when it's snowing, it's not falling on their faces. To build four temporary shelters in Afghanistan, which will survive four families. An, av an, af an average Afghan family is about six to seven people. They're large families. They're living, they're living with extended family members. Four of those homes cost, uh, temporary homes cost 2,200 pounds. Now I'm going to ask in very quickly, or very soon, inshallah, for somebody to raise a hand to start us off on our first fundraising pledge, inshallah, for £2,200 to support four families. But before I do that, brothers and sisters, I will ask you over and over again, what would you do, what price would you pay to protect your children from sleeping out in the cold today here in the UK? It's not bad as it's in Afghanistan. You have lo we have security, we have cameras. Even then, what would you pay? We would pay anything out of the odds to make sure our children are protected. Even majority of brothers in front of me, those of you who are married, would you ever leave your wife in a tent outside in the desert like that? Forget the natural disasters, the fear of man-made calamity, the fear of abuse won't let you sleep at night. That's what our brothers and sisters are going through. That's what our sisters are having to live through in Afghanistan. So I want to see the first person, inshallah, who starts off this appeal with 2,200 pounds. You can donate it tonight. You can donate it over the next month or so. Ramadan is coming. You can also intend to fundraise. As a group, as a family, we'll help you as Islamic Relief to set up the pages so you can send out your text messages to your friends and family and say, as a family, as a group of friends, we want to raise £2,200 to support four families in Afghanistan with shelter, inshallah. Who's going to be the first brave soul, inshallah, to raise their hand? Who's going to be that first person to answer that call? And believe me, as fundraisers, the hardest part is the first hand. We know this. As soon as the first one comes, the rest will follow, inshallah. So it takes that first brave soul, and inshallah, they will be recorded, rewarded accordingly. We have the brother at the front who's raised his hand. Can we have a takbir? Allahu Akbar. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta give this brother, his family, 
a sense of peace, a sense of ease that he's never seen before. Yeah, yeah. All of us have uh, enjoyed some sort of ease in our life. But when people give out of their own hard earnings, when people give at a time where most people are not sure about the financial stability in the UK, it's harder and it's tough. When people do that, inshallah, we make specific dua, inshallah, that Allah, ta Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards them more than they can imagine, Amen. more than that they can ever think of, inshallah. Amen. Who is going to be the next person? Is there a second person in this room, inshallah? And the sisters as well. There are some volunteers there. There are some volunteers in the sister side. If you can communicate with them, raise your hand so the volunteers can see you and we'll take you from there. Do we have a second hand in the room? Do we have a second hand for 2,200 pounds for four families? Yes, we do. We have another brother at the back. Say, can you take me? Take me? And final, take me? This is London. You brothers are known for giving good tech beers, right? <laughs> so you have to be loud and ready. We want to put, Chef's been traveling up and down the country and he tells me Glasgow. They can't speak English properly, but apparently they're in Glasgow. They do a nice tech beer. So let's have one nice, nice loud one here. Tech beer. Allah, there we go. Welcome London, mashallah. Right. Do we have one more? Do we have a final hand in the sister's side or the brother's side who wants to donate £2,200 for four families or wants to raise it over the next month? I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I know it's a Monday next morning. So we want to wrap this up as quick as we can. If not, I'm going to move on to the next figure, inshallah. And it's going to be half. So we want somebody here, inshallah, a again, a family, a friend, or group of people to say we will take the responsibility of two Afghan families that I've never seen before. In fact, I will never see in my life. The only time I may see them in the other side, in the, uh, on the other side in Akhirah. When, when I see them then, when, when you see them then, inshallah, you will know who you supported. Until then, we don't know who we're supporting. Most of us here will never see the faces who you give our money to. But they will know, and, 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 and most importantly, our Allah knows that they, you, you have donated and supported this family. Who here, inshallah, is going to be able to support us to build two homes for £1,100? For two homes, inshallah, for £1,100. Who's going to be the first person to start off? We have one at the back. Take me! Take me! Take me! But this, every time I say this, I get louder and louder, not quieter and quieter, yeah? Mashallah, we're going to be on a different uh, level here. Our one just exceeds, doesn't never go down. And we want the sisters upstairs to be thinking, why is the roof shaking? Because these brothers are giving loud tech beers. And to a nice opportunity for us to do. One of our uh, friends was uh, introducing the fundraiser last night. He was saying, when you go to the gym and you do reps, right? That's uh, practicing, you building your muscles. When you do takbir, it's the practice, the reps of your tongue, inshallah, for Ramadan, inshallah. So, do we have one more person in the room? If not, I'm going to move to, and I think there's going to be many people here who can support one home, one family. Do it as though it's from your entire family. In fact, ask your family. Say, as a group, everyone has a family WhatsApp group. 550 pounds. 550 pounds, put it in the WhatsApp and say, look, I've made intention as a family, we want to donate for one shelter in Afghanistan for our family, as our family. Do it in the name of your family. So do it as a group, send it in your group, and I'm sure everyone donates 50 pounds, 100 pounds each between the family network, you can do that. Who is going to be the first person, inshallah, for 550 pounds? We have one brother here, Takbir. Who is going to be the second person here, inshallah, to donate 550 pounds? Or even say, we, uh, even say we will take on the, the challenge, inshallah, to raise it over Ramadan. It's a month of giving. Everyone's going to contribute within a WhatsApp message. We all know. You send a broadcast out, everyone donates 10, 20 pounds, you'll reach 550 pounds very easily. We have a second brother at the back, Takbir. Who's going to be the third person? The third person, we have a third person over here at the front. Take me! Do we have a fourth person? Do we have a fourth person, inshallah, here who can donate four, 550 pounds? Again, you can donate it in cash, you can donate it in card. The volunteers have PDQ machines on them. Uh, I must say also, when you fill in the form, please, 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 brothers, fill it in in a way that we can read it. Sometimes we go back and then, you know, when you write fast hand, we can't read them, we can't contact you. So please make sure when you fill in the form, it's nice and clear. But we need a fourth hand. Who is going to be the fourth person, inshallah, that donates 550 pounds or raises 550 pounds? We need one more, inshallah, before we can move on to the next item. And the next item are not houses, inshallah, so each houses or each shelter, because 550 pounds. Do we have one more in the room? And we do at the back, mashallah. Take me! Uh, you know, we call them eBay snipers. They wait to the last second 
of the eBay bid and then they put the bid in to win the bid. So these brothers, they, they, there's some people in the fundraising world, we call them eBay snipers. They wait to the last moment and then the, we're just about to move on to the next figure, they pin the drop, mashallah. But this is how you win things, mashallah. Anybody else? Anybody else? No, okay. The next items that we're going to move to, and this is the part where I think everyone can get involved. When I say to you that one million children will die out of starvation, it's expected, it's a figure that's given by the UN. It's not by Islamic Relief and it's not by our friends. The UN are expecting one million children within this year to die from starvation or potentially die from starvation. Food is absolutely necessity. There's any, you know what, even if you sleep, sleep on the streets, there's one thing that you can never give up as human being, is food and water. Those children, those families, those sisters that are living in Afghanistan, it is a common, common trend at this moment of time of people selling their children. Why? And I say this, it breaks every man, it will break every heart to say, I have sold my children. Our director went out there and he met a family and he, he met a man. He said, I had to sell my youngest child. Why? Because the others in front of me, the older ones, they can bear to be hungry for two days or three days. The little one can't stay hungry for two, three days. I can't witness her staying hungry for two, three days, the way she deteriorates. So I sold her on to a rich family. Why? Because they can feed her her food. And then whatever money I get from selling her on, I can use to feed my children. That poor soul, that broken man, then his wife left him. Why? Because she could understand the fact she, why her husband was selling her daughter. Now we're not in a position where we have to make these choices in life about selling our own children. But this is the choice that people have to make on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's the most common story at the moment in Afghanistan of people selling their children purely and purely because of hunger, purely because of food. It costs 250 pounds to make five food packs. So Ramadan's coming around the corner. Every iftar, every suhoor for five families for entire month will cost 250 pounds. That's five families for entire month. 250 pounds will give them iftar and suhoor. You will make, you'll be providing them for the iftar, so for the suhoor and the iftar. And remember, remember the, the hadith about those who support or those who provide a, a meal or date or water for someone to break the fast. It's as though he has fasted himself the whole day. So imagine that. Who's going to be the first person, inshallah, for 250 pounds to donate five Ramadan food packs? We have one person at the back, Takbir. We have a second person at the front, Takbir. Do we have a third person? We have a third person over here, Takbir. Do we have a fourth person? Do we have a fourth person over here? We have four and five, Takbir. Do we have six? The sixth person for 250 pounds, inshallah, for five entire families, for the entire month of Ramadan, you'll be feeding them. You're never going to see their faces in this dunya, but inshallah, every morsel that they eat and every salah that they pray because of the energy, you will be rewarded accordingly. And believe me, this reward is not coming from me. This reward is coming from Allah, the most just. He will never, never shortchange you. Who is going to be the seventh person, inshallah? The seventh person for 250 pounds. In the sister side again, please raise your hands. The volunteers are there. They are more than happy to, inshallah, support you. Who's going to be the seventh person? If not, we're going to break it down and we're going to make it easier for everybody here. And this is where I want every single person here to say, either I can contribute or I know I have the ability to raise the funds. A hundred pounds between, even if you send ten friends and say, guys, in Afghanistan, this Ramadan, I want to, you know, in your friends network, your WhatsApp group, say, there's this Ramadan, there's going to be, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to donate two food packs to two families. It costs a hundred pounds. All you need is 10 friends to give you 10 pounds. That's all you need. 10 friends to give you 10 pounds and it's that easy. Can we have a ray, ray of hands, inshallah? Everyone here should try and support, whether you can donate it yourself, that's two food packs, or whether you fundraise it, inshallah. Again, my team will help you set up the pages so you can send out the messages on your WhatsApp. Let's have a show of hands for two food packs at 100 pounds. Who's gonna be the first person to start us off, inshallah? For two food packs, 
for a hundred pound in this room. We have one brother over here, Takbir. Can we have the second hand, inshallah? Do we have a second hand for two food packs at a hundred pound? A second hand, inshallah. I'm sure everyone can get involved in this, inshallah, or even if 50 pounds. Let's make it easy. I don't want to make too much time. Sheikh Saad is already here. I know he's going to be walking down in the next two minutes. What I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you together, actually. 50 pounds is one food pack, and 100 pounds is two food packs. Anybody who wants to donate two or one food packs, put your hands up. So it's 50 pounds or, or, or 100 pounds. Just put your hands up, inshallah. That's for the entire month of Ramadan. 50 pounds would feed an entire family. Can I have a row of hands? We want two, can we have a third one? We have three over here, mashallah takbir. The fourth hand, do we have a fourth hand over here, inshallah? We have a fourth hand right at the front. Five, six, seven, mashallah. Over there, three people, six, seven. Do we have eight? Eight at the front, mashallah, eight. Do we have nine? Two more, bismillah. Two more, nine and ten, and then I'm running off. I promise you, I'm holding you back already. Nine over here, mashallah. Who's going to be the first person, the final person to round off this night? We have this, oh, oh mashallah, there's two people. Both of you want to take the rewards, no problem. We have ten, and we have one brother at the front here, eleven, mashallah. Right, brother and sister, look, jazakallah khair. I would say to you one last thing. Do, brothers, beyond just donating, do, uh, and we know dua is a weapon of believer, but do we sincerely make dua for these people? Do we actually, be, in fact, I ask you tonight, if we couldn't donate or you have, you have donated, spend one minute, one big minute before you close your eyes tonight, in your bed, when you're in your pajamas, in your quilt, one minute in your eyes, close your eyes and make dua for the people of Afghanistan because why? It's the weapon of the believer. It's the weapon that your Lord has given to you so that you can save them. If you feel heartless, if you feel hopeless, that dua is the bare minimum that we can do as a sign of our taqwa, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. I'm going to invite onto stage, inshallah, uh, Sheikh Saad Nokmani. Uh, who's come all the way from Medina, who's going to be fine back very soon. But one thing I must tell you, mashallah, he has the ability and is mesmerizing in terms of how he recites the Quran. And believe me, I don't know how he does it. He goes from deep voices to very squeaky voices. I don't know how he does it, but he's a very talented man. Allah has given him this unique ability. I would ask you, close your eyes. We'll try and play some video. Remind yourselves, because he will be reciting the name of some of the Imams of the Haramain. And you'll remind me of Mecca and Medina, inshallah. Let's make the most of it. Sheikh Saad Nu'mani. Jazakallah khair. Just a final reminder, please, please, please ensure you fill in the forms. If you haven't had the chance to fill it in right now and give it to us, then on your way out, do provide it to the volunteers. You can donate by cash or card if you wanted to, but do please fill in those forms and give it back to us so that we can contact you accordingly, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li'ad. Wa attaqullaha in. Oh, no. 
فاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله This was my own style. Now, inshallah, in the voice of Sheikh Saud bin Ibrahim al-Shurim. Inshallah, I'll give you a little bit of a new one from the Ayimah al-Haramin al-Sharifin and others. Or, inshallah, I'll give you a Sheikh Saud bin Ibrahim al-Shurim, Hafidhah Allah, Imam al-Khatib al-Masjid al-Haram. A'udhu billahi minash shaytan al-Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم الشيخ حسين بن عبد العزيز آل الشيخ حفظه الله إمام وخطيب المسجد النبوي الشريف أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين إن الذين سبقت لهم من الحسنى الشيخ علي بن عبد الرحمن الحذيفي حفظه الله تعالى سين الإمام الحرمين الشريفين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يوم نطوي السماء كطي السجل للكتب كما بدأنا أول خلق نعيد وعدا علينا Oh.
الشيخ صلاح البدير حفظه الله في المسجد النبوي الشريف أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض الشيخ مشاري راشد العفاسي from Kuwait أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم وإلى المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير. الشيخ أحمد العجمي حفظه الله from Saudi Arabia. And this tune is especially for our children. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا Oh, my God. 
الشيخ عبد المحسن القاسم حفظه الله في المسجد النبوي الشريف اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اصبروا وصابروا ورابطوا واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون الشيخ سعد الغامدي حفظه الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير فحسبتم أنما خلقناكم عبثا وأنكم إلينا لا ترجعون فتعالى الله الملك الحق لا إله إلا هو رب العرش الكريم ومن الشيخ محمد أيوب رحمه الله في المسجد النبوي الشريف أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم الشيخ عبد الرحمن السديس حفظه الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم Bonjour.
I think many of you will remind you of the Haram and if you've been to Umrah, you will remind a lot of these voices you'll hear. Much if you close your eyes, it'll remind you of those days. Those of you who haven't been, this is a taste of what the Haram feels like when you go there, inshallah. For Sheikh, for the little Sheikh who traveling with us, for those of you who don't know, it's very tiresome. They've been traveling from Glasgow all the way down to London and back and forth, back and forth for the last two weeks, as well as Sheikh Hasib. We honestly, from Islamic Relief, from our staff, from our volunteer Sheikh, we make dua that Allah gives you long, long life, that you can encourage many, many more thousands and hundreds of thousands of Muslims to love the Quran, to listen to the Quran, especially the youth. It's tough nowadays to get the children inside the masjid, but something like this definitely helps. Jazakallah khair for everyone for staying. Keep us in your duas. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.